So hello everyone, this is Tina. This presentation is on distributional contrastive embedding for clarification-based conversational critiquing. So now let's start with a quick example of a restaurant recommendation critiquing scenario. This recommendation involves the user and an assistant. The interaction starts with the user asking for restaurant recommendations. The system then recommends a list of restaurants based on the user's historical preferences. But there are scenarios where the user is accompanied by his girlfriend or wife who doesn't like spicy food. So after seeing the top recommendations or the dishes, the user then provides a critiquing feedback indicating that they don't want jalapenos in their food options. So the system would then provide a refined list of recommendations. However, there are still recommended items that majorly serve spicy food since the user only negated jalapenos. So actually the user is with his family and one of the user's kids requires to eat chicken finger and then a positive critique follows and the system adjusts the recommendation list correspondingly based on the feedback. But tiki bars and burger bars are not really ideal under this scenario since a restaurant with a kid's menu was really the intended preference instead of these places, although they serve chicken fingers too. Then the user needs to provide further feedback to get more suitable recommendations. So this is an example of key phrase based critiquing in recommender systems, where the system recommends a set of items, the user then chooses to accept or uh, provide critiques based on these recommendations. The system would then refine the recommendation list. And step two and three is repeated until the user is satisfied with one of the recommendations. But as I pointed out, there are problems in the previous examples. So in this example, the user provided a noisy feedback that is overly specific, considering the fact that a place that has kids menu is more suitable for them. So now what if instead of providing a refined recommendation list immediately, the system asks a question to clarify the user's intent. For example, did you mean kids menu? And uh, this step helps the system to identify user's preference scope faster, and the, the conversational recommendation process can end more efficiently. So for this work, we propose a novel clarification-based conversational recommendation framework, which allows the system to, cl uh, to clarify the user's preference as it accepts user critiques. So what's the novelty of this framework? So we have went through the workflow for conversational critiquing framework, which repeats the step of system providing recommendations, the user accepts or provides uh, key first critiques, the process does not end until the user is satisfied with a recommended item. For clarification-based critiquing framework, this workflow adds in an extra step that allows the system to ask user questions in order to clarify uh, the preference uncertainties. So the judging criteria here could be whether the user has denied the clarifying key phrase more than delta times. Upon receiving the user's uh, responses, for example, the user accepts a clarifying key phrase for disliking spicy instead of the original critique for disliking jalapeno. The system then provides uh, the refined recommendations. So this preference clarification component in the diagram shows the work that has been done in our paper, which is important, but has been overlooked in the research field. So now the question is, how do we enable this step for the system to prompt clarification questions? So for clarification-based conversational critiquing, it supports learning distributions for preferential key phrase embeddings. And why do we work under these settings? Recall that the users tend to provide noisy critiques that are either overly specific or overly generic. So first, why are we working with Latin embeddings? In order to generalize and over-specialize user feedback, the system needs, to, uh, needs domain-specific ontologies between these critiquable key phrases, which are not available. And therefore, these subsumption relationships can be only inferred from the recommendation training data. And why do we want to learn distributional embeddings? In order to clarify a user's intention, the system needs to understand the concept of generality through distributional semantic overlaps. So taking the example on the right, which uh, with point embeddings, we see that we cannot understand the generality of concepts in this figure 
but only the similarities between them. So that's the caveat of using point embeddings. So, but if we use Gaussian embeddings, we can get the information of conceptual coverage. So taking the example on the right, for concepts that have higher covariance or determinants, they are having higher conceptual coverage in this two-dimensional space, for example, and therefore having higher generality. Note that the user embeddings produced by the backbone via ECF model is also in the form of multivariate Gaussian. This enables the contrastive learning aspect of our final model. So we now introduce our model, which we term it as DCVAE. It incorporates distributional contrastive embeddings of critiquable key phrases with user preference embeddings in a VAE recommendation framework. So in the derivation of the objective function, given the user's historical interaction records R and their corresponding key phrase preferences K, we are maximizing the joint log likelihood, which can be factorized into two components. So the rating likelihood uh, log PR can be modeled through its variational lower bound, which gives us the objective function used for VACF for recommender systems. The conditional term log P of uh, K given R gives the contrastive loss portion. We optimize its lower bound to avoid computing the log expectation term. So given the key phrase preference vector for a user, we obtain positive and negative samples with the vector. And from there on, between the key phrases, we can compute um, the key phrase, the key phrase contrastive loss. And similarly, we can uh, compute the contrastive uh, losses between the user representation and the key phrase samples. So these will contribute to the uh, contrastive loss in the objective function. So on top of training the recommendation model using the VAECF objective, we learned the Gaussian embeddings for key phrase contrastively. Remembering that enable system clarifications, we need to infer the subsumption relationships from recommendation data. So how does contrastive learning and Gaussian embeddings help us achieve that goal? During contrastive learning, the model embeds similar concepts close to each other, while the similar ones are far apart in distance wise. And if we apply the contrastive learning concept onto Gaussian embeddings or Gaussian distributions, um, the learned embeddings will stretch or shrink uh, their distributional coverage corresponding to their concept generality or specificity. The learned Gaussian embeddings will help to infer this hierarchical relationships between the criticable key phrases, since we are performing the contrastive learning with user, user embeddings from VACF. This process also helps to indicate user preference scope and creating the compatibility between key phrases and the users on the embedding space. So now given our trained key phrase Gaussian embeddings, we can produce a key phrase knowledge tree to automatically extract the domain specific subsumption relationships among the key phrases. So to construct the knowledge tree, we perform a divisive hierarchical clustering using the trained key phrase Gaussian embeddings. We first initialize a single cluster and select a key phrase that has the highest distributional similarity with all other key phrases to represent the main concept of the root cluster. We then determine the optimal number of subclusters using the elbow method and use k-means partition to divide data into uh, different subclusters. This process is repeated recursively until maximal hierarchy is, reach is reached or uh, each cluster contains only one uh, concept at the end. So to summarize the contribution of this paper before our experiment section, we have proposed a novel methodology for clarification in critiquing based uh, CRS. This involves proposing a model that is a distributional contrastive embedding variant of the VAECF model, which we term DCVAE. This model, model now supports the reasoning of generality and specificity of key phrase critiques. To do so, this model co-embeds the key phrase and user preference re uh, representations contrastively in the form of Gaussian embeddings. These embeddings are then used to generate a key phrase knowledge tree that helps to determine the generality and specificity of the key phrases in the context of a given recommendation domain. Because of the co-embedding, it is able to produce personalized clarification suggestions based on users' historical preferences. So now on to the experimental evaluation section. 
So for the experiments, we make use of two public data sets, which is the Yelp data set and the MovieLens data set. The experiment is performed under a user simulation setup, where users have a desired target item in each session, and they will provide critiques with respect to that target. Uh, we are trying to answer the following research questions. First one, whether the recommendation quality is competitive with state-of-the-art methods, and whether the key phrase knowledge tree form uh, concise and coherent hierarchical clusters. Uh, is the multi-step critiquing performance competitive with state-of-the-art uh, framework? And does the personalized clarifications improve conversational efficiency? We're using hit rate at five or 10. Uh, as the metric for the last two experiments because we want to measure how often the target item is ranked within the top k recommendations we compared dc vae with bk vae which is an existing critiquing framework that uses a vacf as the backbone model as well so now uh, we are trying to answer the research question of whether multi-step critiquing performance is competitive with state-of-the-art method during simulation we have two types of users First type of user is the expert who always critique key phrases that deviates the most between the target item and the current recommendations. Second time is the normal users who provide noisy critiques comparing to the experts. Uh, for example, they negate jalapenos instead of spicy. So the results for the critiquing only task is the following. So first we can observe that DC VAE outperforms BK VAE in multi-step critiquing for both type of users. And secondly, we can see that the margin generally increases as the critiquing interactions uh, proceed, uh, proce uh, progress proceeds. So we can conclude that uh, DCAVAE has this competitive with uh, the state of the art critiquing framework. So now we want to see whether the clarification based critiquing outperforms standard critiquing paradigm. For the clarification-based critiquing workflow, we are adding this clarification step to each round of the critiquing. We are comparing three different methods. Two baselines are the variants for BKVAE. So the first one is modeling using BKVAE and select the nearest neighbor for clarification using cosine distance between uh, the key phrase concept activation vectors. And the second one is BK random, which picks the random key phrases as clarification key phrase. And the third one is DC tree, which chooses suggestions based on the key phrase knowledge tree. And we note that DC tree outperforms the baseline consistently for both data sets with a remarkable performance margin. And for the Analton data set, random selection even has better performance than using nearest neighbor, indicating that many nearest neighbor clarification proposals, uh, they might be uh, highly suboptimal. So finally, for personalized clarification critiquing, whether it improves the efficiency, we believe that clarific uh, clar clarification steps should be personalized. We compare three different workflows that take different approaches. First one is personalized clarification that selects key phrases based on distributional overlaps between the user representations. Second one is non-personalized that selects key phrases just based on the distributional overlap between the candidate key phrases. And the third one, of course, is the one without the clar uh, clarification step that are pure critiquing. So from the result, we can see that the clarification enhanced the conver uh, conversation, these ones, they consistently outperform that of the critiquing only conversations. So this suggests that, um, and, and secondly, uh, personalization really helps. This suggests that the selection of clarification queries should ideally take account the user's preference history. So now to summarize, uh, our model DCVAE is proposed for the novel concept of clarification-based conversational critiquing, where we make use of distributional or Gaussian contrastive embeddings to help identify the generality and specificity of preference key phrases. DCVAE has competitive critiquing performance, and for clarification-based critiquing, it outperforms the standard critiquing paradigm, and personalization improves the conversational efficiency. So that concludes my presentation for this work. Please feel free to contact us if you have any further questions. And thank you. Thank you for the presenter. Um, do we have anyone from from uh, 
uh, from the other basis here to answer questions? Uh, yes, uh, I'm here. This is Tina. Tina, Tina, hi, Tina. Um, let me see. We don't have any questions, I guess, from the chat. Um, does anyone from here want to ask questions from the participants? If you want to ask questions, you can. Yes, uh, I have a question. Okay, so, go ahead. Um, Tina, for the learning key phrase embeddings, uh, can you briefly explain how your data is represented? So what was the, the last point that the data represented? Yes, so how, how what's, what's the input basically uh, to your VAE? Okay, so for, uh, okay, got it. So for uh, part of the model, it just follows the original like conventional, like the VAE inputs. So it's just the user and item interactions. We used uh, mm -hmm. binary data. And then the second part where we do the contrastive learning uh, section. Uh, so the data that we really fed in, that, that model read was still like a binary uh, vectors. So between, uh, it was like an interaction between the user and the key phrases. So it's still like, um, yeah, for each user, they will have like a vector of the interactions between all the critical key phrases. And because it's a binary vector, we know that for each user, uh, which are the positive key phrases, uh, positive samples, and which are the negative samples. And within that uh, space, uh, between the key phrases, uh, there are also positive and negative samples there. So that's how we uh, we were able to do the, the contrastive learning part. And yeah, so that's the input that we use. Yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, anyone else has a question? Um, Tina, I actually have one question. Um, in the um, experimentation sort of uh, session um, uh, for the Yelp data sets, um, I think um, on the left hand side, they see sort of uh, show the uh, you compare the result for personalized versus uh, non personalized one. What does steps, uh, sort of different steps mean over there? And also, I saw on the like as you progress, basic step um, toward the end, um, actually, the difference between the personalized verse and non personalized is actually sort of pretty small for the Yelp sort of data set. Just wonder if you have any sort of intuition. Uh, okay, just let me see. Oh, okay, got it. So sorry, but the first part of the question is, what's the difference between the personalized and non-personalized? No, the basically the steps. Um, here is what the steps basically mean. The basic oh, oh, the steps. Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. The steps is a number of critiques provided by the user, like in the in the simulation section. So okay. it's just five means the user has provided five uh, critiques over there. Got it. Got it. And then the. It looks like basically the personalized version, non-personalized basically sort of the gap shrink, right? Uh, for the Yelp data so I just wonder if you see, uh, do you have any intuition? Oh yeah, I see. So for the, yes, for this part, the non-personalized is closing out the gap. Um, I, I think it's because the Yelp data sets, okay, so for here, there's a limitation. It's uh, how, how we are choosing the clarification key phrase depends on the, the data set, the quality. So I would say that for Yelp data set, it, uh, the way that we got our the key phrase knowledge tree, it's um, it was giving like pretty intuitive results, and I think I have an example in the paper as well. So uh, if, if we choose the the scope uh, in the in the in the subtree part, then it's pretty like intuitive in terms of when we try to uh, choose the key phrase based on like users' personalized preference. And comparing to uh, like a movie lens data set, uh, the data set quality is a little bit poor <laughs> comparing to Yelp data set. Yeah, sense. so that's why. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, Tina. Um, it's a great presentation.